My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. But this is definitely a smorgasbord of different options uh, and things that we saw at ID Week. I have no disclosures. The first is actually a, a very practical study that was presented by Kevin Camus at Dev Denver Health on same-day HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis initiation at their drop-in STD clinic. So for background, we know that patients who are at high risk for developing HIV often have to go through a referral process to get on PrEP, and that STD clinics see patients who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. So what they were really looking at is, is it feasible to do same-day PrEP start the way that we do same-day OCP start or same-day ARV start, and then will people follow up? So this was a study that was sponsored by Gilead. They prospectively enrolled 100 patients and just saw what happened, basically. This was their kind of clinic flow. So as the patients came into the clinic, the STD clinic provider would confirm their eligibility and need for PrEP, provide some initial counseling, and then write a script for PrEP to be picked up that same day and order the labs, their serum creatinine, Hep B, HIV, and urine pregnancy test. Then do a hot handoff to a PrEP navigator who is also their study coordinator who would do any additional counseling, help out with the financial aspects of everything, and schedule them for a one-month follow-up at a participating clinic, which was notably not this same clinic. So they were switching over to a long-term care clinic. And then they were able to pick up their drug at an on-site pharmacy. That same day, all of their labs would come back and the STD clinic nurse practitioner would check and make sure that it was safe for them to start PrEP mm -hmm. by checking their creatinine clearance, reactive H, uh, Hep B, and then within the same week, the study coordinator would just give a call, make sure everything was going okay, and give them a reminder for their follow-up appointment, at which point the STD clinic stopped their involvement and just followed from a distance to see what happened. So they enrolled 100 patients, and then between that same-day PrEP start and attending that first follow-up, they lost 20, 22 of them. Only 18, though, were truly lost to follow-up. One moved out of state, and then three stopped Truvada due to side effects. And then they saw the similar drop-off that we've seen in a, t in a lot of PrEP studies with people at that second PrEP visit or at that six-month PrEP visit, however long that is at, that's when people really do drop off. These numbers, though, are pretty consistent with other PrEP studies that we've seen in terms of follow-up. And then in terms of who are they catching, who's coming, they're catching, as you would expect, a pretty young cohort, median age of 28 years, 53% non-Hispanic white, 34% Hispanic. This is, again, in Denver, so mirroring the Denver population. In general, I would draw your attention to the fact that only 26% of them had a primary care provider. So this is a population that's not necessarily in ongoing care at baseline. And then as you might expect, 50% of them had had an STI in the last six months, this being an STD clinic cohort. In terms of feasibility, there were only about four prep starts a week. So they're from the Denver Health's perspective, this was actually pretty feasible for them to do. It didn't require a huge amount of provider time. And then it was very safe. All of, their, all of them had normal serum creatinine. There was no reactive hep B. And there were no HIV seroconversions during the follow-up period. So when they did multivariate analysis to see what was the predictor of whether or not someone would, be att would attend their follow-up appointments, annual income was the strongest predictor and the only statistically significant predictor. And this is, I think, important to note because in Colorado, Col state of Colorado is a prep provider of last resort. So if you can't pay for your prep, Colorado will pay for it for you, separate from the study. So there was a, a pretty significant increase in the odds of attending for your prep follow-up appointment for every $10,000 of annual income. So what was my takeaways from this? Same-day prep is definitely safe and seems to be actually pretty feasible in this situation. And cost, or maybe it's not cost, maybe it's income as a marker for some other life instability, continues to be a major barrier as we've seen in a lot of other studies. So shifting gears, I think we've spent a lot of time in this conference and we'll spend more time today talking about antiretroviral therapy in pregnancy. And so Claudia Crowell is, was presenting for a large group a subset study of the SMART study, which is a registry study looking specifically at birth outcomes for 
children who are exposed to ARV in utero. So this is a registry study that's conducted primarily in the southeastern and eastern United States that has about 4,000 kids involved in it. They use a trigger-based approach to find likely cases, and I'll talk about that in a second. So this sub-study was specifically looking at neurologic cases. So they had 3,759 children who were available for study. They were followed for the first two years of life. Their case definition included microcephaly, febrile seizure, eye abnormalities, hypotonia, and other neurologic diagnoses. And their study method to kind of keep it feasible to be able to pick these kids up, it involves a triggered system. So the patient's regular pediatrician will hear about something, and then if it meets the trigger criteria, that prompts a more detailed uh, analysis or consultation with a subspecialist as needed. And then case determination is done by a blind reviewer. Because this was a big epi study, there were multiple sensitivity analyses conducted, which I will not go through. In terms of the characteristics, 68% of patients in this study are black. Most of them are term babies. Uh, ARV, 70% were exposed to a PI-based regimen in utero, about 20% to efavirenz, and only about 11% to dolutegravir-based regimens. When you look at maternal exposures, you see this is, a, this is a subset of patients who are enriched for tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drug use. And that a pretty substantial number of these moms had high viral loads and low CD4 count. When we look at what the outcome was, their primary outcome or what is the incidence of neuro cases, 6.3% of these children met their case definition. And of those, about 25% had microcephaly, 20% had a febrile seizure, and another 17% had some eye-related abnormality. And you can see the rest of these here. I apologize for the quality of this screen grab, but this is when they did in an, this is a forest plot of the association between different ARVs and the likelihood of being a neuro case. Mm -hmm. And so you can see they've highlighted dolutegravir and efavirenz. I'll start with efavirenz because that's the one that reached st statistical significance in this case. The unadjusted risk ratio did barely cross one at 0.99 for the 95% confidence interval, but in multiple sensitivity analysis, it became statistically significant with an adjusted risk ratio of 1.6. And then the dolutegravir data, I think, is striking. It's a very high magnitude risk ratio at 1.7. It does cross one. But they mentioned, and I think it's very accurate, that they were very underpowered to look at dolutegravir. So I think in combination with some of the other data that we're seeing about dolutegravir, this is suggestive. Again, these are associations. They don't prove causation. But I think that this is something that we need to be thinking about. So in summary for this, 6.3% of evaluable participants met criteria. The clinical implications of these disorders is not known. For example, febrile seizures in a young child, it's really unclear what that has, implication that has for later life. And there was a significant association between efavirenz exposure in utero and neuro case status, and a trend towards an association of significant magnitude at 2.1 between dolutegravir and neuro case status, but again, small sample size. I think this really highlights something that we've talked about a lot in this conference, which is that we really just don't know what the best regimen for pregnant women living with HIV is. And then for another very abrupt shift, I thought this talk was fascinating about HIV and the microbiome. So this is some basic science that was presented. And there was a third presenter here from the University of Washington talking about the vaginal microbiome, but we're gonna talk about the rectal microbiome and the gut microbiome with HIV. So HIV infection we know leads to increased inflammation and we believe that the gut is central to that. So HIV directly causes immune activation, <clears throat> also has a direct um, toxic effect on the tight junctions of the gut leading to epithelial damage and CD4 cell depletion in the gut, which leads to microbial translocation, which leads to immune activation, which leads to CD4 cells trafficked into the gut, which are of course driving this whole replicative cycle. We've known that people for a long time that people living with HIV and particularly MSM living with HIV have gut dysbiosis, meaning alterations in their gut microbiome as compared to controls, but the causality has never been fully understood. Dr. Branchley, who works at NIH, and he does monkey studies, uh, presented some really elegant studies about dysbiosis and in, in SIV infection. And so 
This, I'll just take you through this slide very briefly. Each triplet of these bar graphs is an individual macaque followed longitudinally across SIV infection. So that's simian immunodeficiency virus. And the thing to notice here is that the that there's really no change. Only this one individual here has a statistically significant change in their gut microbiome, and that's only at that very acute phase of infection. So this is pre-infection, acute infection, and then long-term infection on ARV. For the rest of them, there's no real longitudinal change, which really suggests that HIV is not the driver of this gut dysbiosis. He did a number of other studies, which I won't present, but really reinforced this and so we were left at the end of his talk with really two options. Either the primate model of HIV that has worked for every other manifestation of HIV, including the inflammatory and immune modulatory manifestations of HIV, for some reason doesn't work in the gut, that this is the exception, or that there's another mechanism causing gut dysbiosis in HIV-infected MSM. In support of this second option, there are some studies looking at serodifferent MSM couples that show that their microbiomes are more similar than they are different when you compare serodifferent MSM couples with HIV positive and negative to non-MSM couples. And so Colleen Kelly is very interested in this and specifically looking at the effect of receptive anal intercourse on the gut microbiome and the rectal microbiome. She points out that the mucosal barrier of the rectum is histologically different from the female genital tract in the penis. The, the rectum is a, a single cell columnar epithelium, whereas the female genital tract and the penis are stratified epithelium, much, more, much less uh, susceptible to microtrauma from abrasion, and that there are multiple behaviors associated with receptive anal intercourse that may also be having an effect enemas, douching, the use of lube, and then potentially something else. So she looked at, she took two groups of people, uh, gay men who had never had receptive anal intercourse and gay men who had receptive anal intercourse as a part of their normal sexual practices, all of whom were HIV negative, and looked at their microbiomes. And what you can see here is that the two groups here, the control side versus the uh, participants who have receptive anal intercourse, you can see this enrichment for yellow in people who are engaging in receptive anal intercourse. And that represents Prevotella. Prevotella is thought to be at some, to have a, uh, an effect on the arachidonic acid metabolism, and arachidonic acid is produced in the setting of microtrauma. And so the thought is that this Prevotella enrichment, which we also see in HIV-positive MSM, may be in some way related to microtrauma. She then in investigated the effects of lube um, through the PrEP lube study. This was initiated after it had been seen that lubricant use had an effect on vaginal uh, tenofovir levels, and so they wanted to make sure that tenofovir levels would be high enough in the rectal mucosa for men who are engaging in receptive anal intercourse. So this is 60 HIV negative gay men who are randomized to either take just oral PrEP or to, a, to only apply 4 mLs of hyperosmolar, hyperosmolar lubricant to the rectum for seven days or to do both. And they looked at a number of different things, but I'll just present two things. One is that turns out the tenofovir and emtricitabine levels are not different. They're totally fine, so we don't need to worry about that. That was their primary endpoint. But we also saw without any, there was no sex during this uh, study, but with just the application of, of this hyperosmolar lube, we again saw decreases in the relative abundance of Bacteroides species and increases in the amount of Prevotella which suggests, and then the hyperosmolic lube does cause this kind of microtrauma to the epithelium, which suggests that the Prevotella driver may be something related to sexual practice rather than the actual HIV infection. This is, again, very early data, um, small numbers, but is really suggestive that, there's, that there are other things going on in the populations that we see. So in summary, same-day prep start is feasible and likely an effective way to get people that we might not otherwise be reaching onto prep. There is increasing evidence for neural complications from ARV exposure in utero, and we don't still, I don't think, know what the right combination of ARVs will be, end up being for pregnant women. And that 
Condomless receptive anal intercourse may be part of, part of, if not the whole explanation for gut di- uh, dysbiosis and MSM living with HIV. So that is a potpourri of various things that I saw at ID Week that just caught my eye and I thought were really suggestive studies. And I am happy to take questions or we can get started on the cases.